How about we add some dirt and mud to our models? Adding earth effects to our models is a great way to finish off all the other steps that we've put on to make it use worn and heavy and weathered looking. The earth effects are really going to be the thing that sells everything else. Now, as with any other weathering effect that we put on our models, there are several considerations that I think we need to take into effect as we're planning what we want to do. When I'm thinking about what I want to do on the earth effects for my model, the first thing I think about is the question of where. Where is this taking place? Is it in a desert? Is it in a jungle? Is there going to be wet mud? Is it going to be a lot of dust? Is there going to be stuff that clings to it? I've been to enough places here in the U.S. and even a few around the world that I've seen a wide variety of mud. Uh, the military helped me see uh, the kinds of mud that we may have to operate in with any of our models or vehicles. And some places that mud can be very clingy and very thick. Other places it's much more liquid. It's, it's not going to stick to the vehicles. Some places when it dries on it falls right off. Other you can't get that stuff off with a sledgehammer. And the same way with dust. A more dry environment is going to have a lot more dust, whereas a more swampy environment is going to have a lot more wet mud. An urban environment may have dust and other effects that are driven by uh, concrete and buildings and things like that. So thinking in terms of the setting is going to help you decide what products and other factors that you need to include when you're putting the earth effects on your model. Now once I've decided the where in terms of where I'm going to be placing my model, I can start thinking in terms of color. And the color again is going to be driven by well, what's the color of mud, what's the color of dirt that's local to that region. I grew up in South Georgia and North Florida in the United States. And in South Georgia especially, there are a lot of places where there's some very red clay that's just underneath the soil. And when you had a military vehicle that went and disturbed that top surface of ground and got down to that red clay, there was some very red clumpy mud that would come up if it were raining or things like that. So it can, it can be driven by the region that you're in. Even if you've never been to the region that you're modeling, you can look at historical photos or even be in touch with other modelers who may live there and just ask them, what's the dirt look like there? Can you go take a few pictures of a muddy street or a muddy dirt road after a rainstorm? That's going to help you in picking your color selection. Of course, as we always do, we need to factor in scale. Scale is what sells the notion of, okay, this is believable or not. So when we're doing any earth effects on the models, thinking in terms of how big would this mud effect be? How high up on the vehicle would it go? How big a clump could we expect to see of mud? All of those things and thinking of them in terms of relation to a human. So if I'm looking at a tank and I see in a picture that the mud on that tank appears to go up as high as a human, and then the dust effects cover the whole thing, that's going to give me some sense of scale. If I also see that, that none of those clumps, the very large clumps that kind of dry together, if none of them seem to be much bigger than, say, my fist, and then they're just all clumped together next to each other like that, that gives me some information that I can use to translate on the model so that it doesn't necessarily look like one just giant wall of mud along the tank or the sides of the car or even on some kind of flying vehicle that has to land in a muddy area. Even on people, uh, you know, mud will get on their pants and on their boots. Having a sense of scale, how big does this look next to a human, is going to really help us translate that onto the model and sell to the brain that when we're looking at it, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense to me because it fits what I've seen out in the real world. So scale is always a consideration. Another factor I like to consider is what I kind of have lumped under the term in my notes. Um, just what is the effect of the mud? Does it get everywhere? Is everything underneath that already dusty and dirty? Or is it fairly clean looking? 
In the example I gave earlier of the Jeep that I saw that was covered in mud, the areas that didn't have mud on them were actually very clean and looked fairly new. So you could tell it was a very well-maintained vehicle and they just hadn't washed off the mud and the dirt from whatever their weekend excursion had been. However, on a military vehicle, it may have been operating an environment for a long time. It may have a lot of other damage. There may be mud and dirt and dust effects over the whole thing. And then there may be some concentrated in some areas. But thinking in terms of what are the overall effects of that mud on the vehicle, on the model, over its life, and how do they cumulatively tell the story, that'll also help give us some information when it comes to putting these things on our model. Now, a final thing that I like to think about is what I call the modeling factor. While, again, to use that, that same Jeep that I've been referring to, while that Jeep, on the areas that were covered in mud, they were totally covered. It wasn't thick, clumpy mud, but it was enough that it discolored everything that it was on. It was the sides of the vehicle. You could see the splash pattern up the sides. It was all this kind of just tannish, muddy, dried up mud look. It covered everything. Not so thick that you couldn't see details, but all of it was covered. However, on a scale model, because of the small size of them, I think sometimes it's important to consider how much do we cover up? Because while covering up, say, the, the road wheels on a tank may be very realistic in terms of how would this actually look. When someone views that and a lot of the detail is obscured, we may not be selling the model fully to their brain. Yeah, their brain sees the, the mud and they get that, but they miss out on the enjoyment of all of the detail that's there. So I think sometimes when we place weathering effects on our model, earth effects, we need to consider, do we need to dial it back a little bit? Do we need to blend it down? Do we need to let some of the details show through here and there to feature everything that's on the model? The person looking at it will still see that and their brain will go, yeah, that's muddy, I get that. It will almost be as if they see it fully covered in mud, but will have the little benefit there of the reward of the extra details that are there. The other effects that we've put on, the chipping and the paint color and the fluid stains and all of that. So I think factoring that in is kind of that modeling intangible that there's a point where you can put enough mud on to sell realism, but still not entirely obscure all of the details of the model so that the viewer gets the complete picture of everything that's, there, everything that's there and plenty of little points and details to take in visually. Now the first thing I want to demonstrate is using a couple of products to add dust effects to our models. Anytime any vehicle drives anywhere, dust is a factor. Even if it's only very light dust. You can drive a car on city streets that are fairly clean and after a couple of months, if you don't wash your car, you can see the effects of dust. Rain will get on the vehicle. Any little dirt effects from particles in the air will cling to it. When it dries up, it leaves a little film. So dust is something that's ever present on any vehicle, anywhere, anytime. It just comes down to the degree and the color. So putting some dust effects as the basis for what's on your model will set the stage for all of the earth effects to come later. Now, just a quick editing note in this next segment, the audio is horrible because I forgot to plug my mic in. Had it clipped on, forgot to plug it in. And apparently the two have to be in unison. So the audio in this next portion is pretty bad and I apologize, but what do you do? Now when applying pigments, I start by just putting some of the pigments right onto the model surface. I don't use a lot because I want to be able to control the effect. And I put those on going up as high as I think it needs to be. It's going to vary depending on the model you're building and the effect you're going for, but you just imagine how high up will the, the dust go onto the model. And then I just begin blending that in a little bit. And you can see a little bit of the pigment dust coming off of it. 
and then I just occasionally wipe it off on a paper towel. Now once I have it on there, I can then go in and use water if I want to streak it a little bit to kind of change the appearance to take it off to do whatever I want to do now this is not the neatest job of it obviously but you get the idea water can pull it back and then I can go back in and just start adding more on top of it. Now with the addition of the water you see that it changes the appearance of the pigment. Now this can be used to our advantage because once it dries the pigment is in place and the water can sometimes help control where it goes. So experiment with using both dry and water pigments and see how that turns out for you. The thing to remember about pigments is when they're on, once they're on there, and remember this is a satin surface, once they're on there they can be wiped off fairly easily. So if you want them to stay you're going to need to do something to fix them. Using pigment fixer will do it but using pigment fixture will also change their appearance just like adding that water did. Adding a final matte coat over it will also lock them in place but it can change the appearance. Note how as it's drying the pigments are now turning lighter and they're showing up where I put them and you're seeing much more of a pattern. So it's just kind of a back and forth process of adding them where you want and manipulating them around on the surface of the model. Acrylic dust effects are simple to apply because they're liquid and they have some color in them. And so what I do is I stipple those on and this is not thinned at all. It's straight from the bottle. And I put that on there in thin layers like this. And then after I get a layer on, I either give it time to dry or I use my hair dryer to dry it. And then I apply another layer. Now you can keep building these layers up until you get the effect that you want. This wash will settle in recesses and panel lines so that those will look dusty. And then it's just a matter of getting however much of the wash you want on the surface to create the dusty effect that you're going for. Again, you just work it as high up on the model as you want to achieve the desired look. For enamel dust products, I put those on, just sort of paint them onto the surface. And I usually don't try to be too particularly neat about it because I'm going to do quite a bit of blending with them. You can use your hair dryer to speed up the drying process. Once they're dry, if you get the effect that you want as is, you can just leave it. However, if you want to blend it, get a little bit of odorless thinner on your brush and damp off most of the thinner. And then you can go in and just begin blending at the edges to reduce that a little bit. Or blending down in the main areas, even doing some streaking of the dust and things like that. The notion of putting, putting streaks in your dust, regardless of what medium you're using, is going to sell it as dust, I think, better than just if it's a solid color. Now, oils work in a similar fashion. Here I'm applying some that have just a little bit of thinner on them. And what I do is I just take those oils and I spread them around where I want generally get it into the areas that I want the dust to appear and then once I have them spread on there I'll give them a little time to dry either just setting them aside or using the hair dryer and then just as I did with the enamels I'll go in and begin blending those with some odorless thinner 
to achieve the effect that I'm looking for. It's very easy to add dust effects to our models and they really help set the foundation for selling the notion that this thing has been operating in some environment and that it's got some age to it and it's been used. So they're easy to apply and they really look good on the model. Now one thing I did not demonstrate was using the airbrush to add dust effects. It's a quick and easy way to do it. The way I usually do it is I just thin some paint way down in my airbrush cup and then I just lightly mist it on in exactly the same places that I would have put the dust on showing the products that I just did. My favorite color for dust is to me is XF55 Deck Tan, but you can choose any color you want that's appropriate for whatever region you're modeling or for whatever effect you're going for, but it's definitely worth a try. Now once we have the dust effects on the model, it's time to start adding the mud and the dirt effects. Now, what I'm going to show here is a very basic application of putting some simple mud effect products, dirt effect products on the model. I'm not making distinctions of color and I'm not making distinctions between dirt and mud because what's really going on there when you have dirt, it's generally stuff that's there and dried up. Mud is going to be more wet. A lot of times both are present. So I'm not going to demonstrate those, but keep in mind that the basic distinction there between just regular dirt effects and mud effects is mud is generally going to be glossier and a little darker. Most types of soil, most types of earth, if you let them dry out, they have one color. If you add water to them, they're usually a little darker. So keep that in mind that if you want to add the impression of mud over the top of your dirt, which is over the top of the dust, then just adding some gloss effects or a slightly darker color is going to help sell that notion. But for the basic application, I'm going to show you a simple way to do it with a couple of products that'll set the basis for mud, for dirt, for anything you're wanting to do. Now applying enamel and mud earth effects is <laughs> essentially identical to the dust effects or any of the, any of the other enamel uh, processes that I've shown in other videos in this series. The main difference is you go for a little more opacity. Now there are products that are enamel that have some texture in them. The only reason I'm not demonstrating that is simply because I don't have any right now. But the application is going to be the same whether it's a textured product or a, a, a non-textured product like this. You're going to put it on in the area that you want to represent the dirt or the mud and you're going to give it a minute to dry. Now once it's dry I'm going to do as I've done before and just go in with a brush damped with thinner. I'm just going to begin to blend that in. And as before, it's, it's pretty much what you think looks right. You can reduce the opacity of the product by just going in and kind of stippling it around like that. You can take it off of some of the edges if you want. You can do a lot of, a lot of different brush movements, I guess you would say, to get the look dialed in just like you want. The, the real difference between the dust and the mud in terms of application here is just the thickness, the opacity of it, and what you do with it after it's on. But this will just represent basic dirt that's clinging to the exterior of whatever it is you're building. It may not be thick clumpy mud, but it's still a layer of dirt on the top. Now if you have enamel products that you want to put on for your dirt effects, but you don't, and you want some texture, but you don't have any enamel products with texture, then what you can do is put on a good layer of enamels like that and then with a dry brush just put some pigment right into that and begin to work that around into the enamel. Now a lot of it will dissolve but you'll end up with some texture and because it's kind of embedded in that enamel 
wash or that enamel uh, earth product, it's going to stay put. You won't have to worry about it coming off. And you go through the same process. You dry it and then blend it. Once it's dry, I just blend it around as I do with any other enamel or oil product. And the process is the same with oils. I'm not going to demonstrate oils because one, there's not a lot of oil products with texture. I, I, don't, I don't recall ever having seen any. And the application of just plain oil in this case is going to be exactly like it would be with enamels. You put it on and then you redistribute it around and blend it with some thinner. But you can see that leaves some texture and I can just build this up. I could even create kind of a slurry of pigment and enamels in my palette and then apply this on just kind of like a paste and that will give me the effect of mud that I'm looking for. Now with, the <clears throat> now with acrylics the application is very similar. If I just want to use just a plain earth colored product, no texture to it, well then I just apply it on like that. But because I can't blend it like I can oils and enamels, then what I do is when I first put it on and it's still wet, that's when I start blending it around a little bit. And that will help me by building up color. Instead of putting it all up once and removing it, remember I've talked about the additive and subtractive portion of it, I can put it on and then dry it and then continue adding layers and working that process. The application may take a little longer but the benefit is that there's faster drying time. And just like I did with the enamels, I can get some of this wash on here. And while it's still wet, I can get a dry brush and just put on some pigments. Just clump that on there. Doesn't have to be super neat. And then here I can just begin applying more of the acrylic weathering product, whichever one you use, and just sort of blend that in. And it's going to dissolve a lot of it, but it's going to leave enough texture that when it dries, it's going to look like mud. And again, you just work it around, but you do the acrylics while they're still wet. If you're wondering why I went off camera for a moment, I was just wetting my brush down so that I could clean some of the pro product off. And just go in here and work it around like that. And it's just a back and forth process. All of this, I keep, I probably sound like a broken record, but all of this is just back and forth, getting it like you want. And eventually you get it to a point that you decide that looks like mud and you're happy with it. Now there are products that are both enamel and acrylic, acrylic that are very helpful in that they already have texture built into them. And some of it can be very fine texture, some of it can be very thick texture. But the application for either one is the same as it would be for any oil, enamel, or acrylic. The rule, of course, as I have talked about, is if it's an oil or enamel, it's a subtractive process. And if it's an acrylic, it's an additive process. Although, right now I'm using an acrylic and I'm kind of blurring the lines, I think, because I've put on a whole lot of it. And I'm just going to go back and blend it while it's still wet. But I can use this just plain water and move this around and blend it in a bit to get it looking like I want and then dry it off. This one's taking a little longer to dry than I thought it would, but you can see that it just gives me some texture and I can go back in and add more of it. I could put pigments on top of this. Once it dries, I could put enamels on top of this. So it's just a real good way of getting some texture, some clumpiness, so that in the end it looks like mud. Now when it comes to adding earth effects to our models, I've only scratched the surface just a little bit 
pun intended. <laughs> but there are so many variables that can go into adding dirt, dust, mud, all of these effects. So keeping all of that in mind and looking at real world pictures, going out and looking around in the world around you, seeing what's there is going to help add all of the elements that can go into this because there can be huge variations in color and how it sticks to a vehicle and what may be present in it. Is it mostly just dirt or is there a lot of, you know, uh, pieces of bark and, and other limbs and things that are in there? Uh, a desert is going to have one type of sand while a jungle is going to have another. So it would be impossible for me to go over all the different possibilities that are there. And there are so many weathering products available, whether it's acrylic, enamels, oils, pigments, or anything else. But looking through those and looking at photos and figuring out what's going to make this thing look like it's been operating in this place, that's the goal. And the application techniques are pretty much what I've shown here. The key is giving it a try. If you've never done it before, take a couple of these simple techniques that I've shown, pick a couple of products and put them on your model and get started. The more you add it to your models, the more you're going to learn. The more you learn, the better you're going to get at it. The better you get at it, the more fun you're going to have. And that's the point of it all, right? It's, it's like when I was a kid. I loved playing in the mud when I was a kid. I still do. I just don't have to go out and roll around in it now. I get to put it on my models instead. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. I know, again, these basic series, if you're a more advanced modeler, you may look at this and go, yeah, this is a little basic guy. And I, I understand that. But there are a lot of people who have never done this but want to. And so starting off with just some foundational things. How do I apply simple dust and dirt to my models? Those foundational things will help set the stage to build up to more advanced effects. So whether you're new or whether you've been doing it for a while, hopefully there's been some information here that has been helpful in some way to help you enjoy what you're doing even more. Well, you know the rest of the routine. There's a subscribe button down over here. If you'd hit that, I'd be grateful. Hit the little bell icon so you'll know when I have new videos out. I would be very grateful if you would leave a comment down below and give this video a like. It helps me grow the channel and I would appreciate it a lot. And if you're on social media, please share these videos. That would be another great way to help me out just by introducing new people to the content that I put out. If you think it's helpful, share it with others and I would be very, very grateful for that. There's also links in the description to my website, to social media, and to Patreon. So if you would please check those out, that would be great and that would help me out a lot. If you're already a Patreon supporter, thank you so much for the support you give to me. It is a blessing not only to me, but it's a blessing to my family because I just wouldn't be able to do this that I do without your support. We simply couldn't afford it. So thank you so very much for the support and the, the, the friendship and the encouragement that you give me. It means a lot to me and I am very thankful for it. And with all that being said, I'll leave you with one final thought as I always like to do. In this hobby, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.